like scary movies? Uh huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and today we are going to scream. <laughs> The sixth screen film is about to come out into theaters, and a lot of you may not have seen one of these in a long time, so we're going to recap everything you need to know before Scream 6. Because, as it turns out, a lot of comic book fans also love a deep dive into the horror genre as well. It must be the shared ability to grasp deeper themes, appreciation of multiple art forms, and the common knowledge that human beings are here for a good time, not a long time, so we might as well have fun with life, even though the stakes are elevated, which forces characters to choose between living and dying. I was just going to say I like being scared, but I like your explanation a lot better. High five. So the original Scream was released on December 20th, 1996, and now, 27 years later, we are about to get the franchise's sixth installment. And if I'm being honest, this is the one that I am most excited about. I'm so freaking excited! Why is that? Well, because if you dig deep enough, you'll come to understand that the entire Scream franchise is about one theme. One theme that can keep this particular set of films going for years to come. Wait, aren't you going to break down the new trailer and like, give us Easter eggs and stuff? Yeah, well, normally I would, but today we want to recap the series for our followers and theorize as to who who might be donning the ghost face hood this time around. This isn't like any other ghost face. And what might be in store for the seventh installment. For an excellent trailer breakdown, Whitney Van Landingham over at New Rockstars did a fantastic job pointing out all the spooky details that we highly suggest you check out. Now, as we stated, the first Scream film was released in December 1996, and it was a hit. Written and created by Kevin Williamson, the first film of the franchise, along with the second, third, and fourth films, would all go on to be directed by horror genius Wes Craven. Hey, I know that name. You should. Wes Craven brought us films and franchises such as The Nightmare on Elm Street, The Last House on the Left, The Hills Have Eyes, The People Under the Stairs, Cursed, Red Eye, My Soul to Take, and of course, Scream. The first film follows Sidney Prescott, played by none other than the queen of Scream herself, Nev Campbell. So it's been one year since Sidney's mother, Maureen Prescott, was found brutally raped and murdered by her side piece, Cotton Weary, played by Lee Schraber. Now, it was Sidney's eyewitness testimony against Cotton that landed him in a one-way ticket to jail. Cotton's biggest defender and public news personality, Gail Weathers, played by Courtney Cox, has written a book about Maureen's murder, where she proclaims that Cotton Cotton was innocent. Now, around the one year anniversary of Maureen's death, strange murders begin to happen in Sydney's hometown of Woodsboro, California, with a masked killer stalking his victims by phone call before getting to the stabby stabby. Most calls focus on the theme of scary movies, which brings us to one of the most iconic lines in cinematic history. What's your favorite scary movie? With the murders happening more frequently, it becomes apparent that Cotton Weary was not Marine's killer, and the fugitive is still on the loose, now hunting Sydney and her friends. Several bodies later, we come to discover that it was Sydney's boyfriend, Billy Loomis, played by Skeet Ulrich, and his very close friend, Stu, played by Matthew Lillard, who were the ghost face killers all along. Surprise, Sydney. After a big Act 3 reveal, Sydney turns the tables on Billy and Stu, killing them and clearing Cotton's name. Now, the second movie finds Sydney in college with a few new friends, who all seem to have her back as she now adjusts to the fame that is put upon her. With the events of the first film making world news and Gail's book about the Woodsboro murders being turned into a film called Stab, it's hard being Sydney Prescott, especially when the calls and the kills begin to happen all over again. Right, well, who was it this time? Well, this time around, it was Sydney's friend, Mickey, and in a shocking but very satisfying twist, reporter Debbie Salt, who was actually big. Billy's mother, who was just out for some good old-fashioned revenge when Sydney killed her son. And then you took my son. The third movie finds Sydney living alone in the mountains of California. She has a new name and a new job as a crisis counselor and has nothing to do with anyone or anything from Woodsboro. But with the production of Stab 3 beginning in Hollywood, Ghostface returns? Ghostface returns. This time, all in the hopes of drawing Sydney out of hiding. One by one, the Stab cast members begin to die in the order they were meant to in the movie. Now, after some detective work with not Princess Leia, it was found that Sydney's mother, Maureen, used to be a Hollywood actress with the stage name of Rena Reynolds, whose life was later ruined by the sexual harassment she encountered from Hollywood film producers while living in Los Angeles. Not only was this part of Maureen's life a complete secret to Sydney and her father, but Maureen also gave birth to another child while living in Hollywood, which she ultimately gave up for adoption before returning to Woodsboro and settling down with Sydney's father. Did the other son show up? Boy, did he. It turns out the killer of this film was Roman Bridger, the director of Stab 3. Now, despite faking his death, Roman shows up declaring himself the orchestrator of not only Maureen Prescott's death, but as the inspiration to Billy and Stu to continue his work for their own cinematic fame. Scream 4 is set 15 years after the original killings and finds Sydney as a newly published author 
author, detailing in a new book how she took her life back from the dark fame of the Woodsboro murders. Gail Weathers is now married to Dewey Riley, who has become the town sheriff, and we're introduced to the new teens of Woodsboro who celebrate the stab movies like cult classics. After Sydney shows up for a short press tour in Woodsboro, ghost face? Ghost face. But since these killings begin with Sydney's arrival, she was forced to stay in town as a suspect in these murders. Man, this poor woman cannot catch a break. You said it. Now, if all this wasn't enough, Sydney's cousin Jill, along with her accomplished Charlie, were the killers in this installment. Jill was mad at her cheating boyfriend, shot him in the junk, and then went on to monologue about how she desired the fame that Sydney had, but did nothing with. I don't need friends. I need fans. After we think Sydney has died, she, Gail, and Dewey all end up surviving and put Jill to rest once and for all. Er, one left. That's right. We now jump to 2022, where Gail and Dewey are now divorced. Dewey is no longer the sheriff. Sydney lives somewhere else with a gun. I'm Sydney Prescott. Of course I have a gun and we are introduced to a whole new slew of teenagers who want to relive Ghostface's glory days. The fifth installment of the franchise takes a meta look into horror movies, the stab movies, and how remakes and requels are all the new rage. Not quite a reboot, not quite a sequel, like the new Halloween. Even Star Wars, it always, always goes back to the original. After figuring out the killer is out to make their own requel of the past events, the phone calls start all over again. Now, the main hero is Sam Carpenter and her sister Tara, who survives the infamous opening attack. Sam lives outside of Woodsboro with her boyfriend Richie, who both decide to return to the slasher town to tend to Tara in the hospital. In the middle of the slicing and dicing, we find out that Sam's true father was Billy Loomis, the first killer of the entire franchise. Those diaries told me who my real father was. It was Billy Loomis. Now, while Billy was dating Sydney in high school, he had an affair with Sam's mom, who then went on to pass Samantha off as her longtime boyfriend's child instead of Billy's. Sam struggles with the identity of being the daughter of a psychopath, but by the end of the movie, embraces who she is and brings justice to the main killer. It was her boyfriend, Richie, wasn't it? Yes, it was. How did you know? She was working with Tara's friend, Amber, all in hopes of restoring the stab films to what they were meant to be, as opposed to the campy and unrealistic stab films that are now pushed out every year. No one has made a great stab movie since the first one. And then her killed Amber. Well, that would be the work of Gail Weathers, who was extremely pissed that Dewey met his end in this film. So now what? It seems like all these movies are just about scary movies and phone calls and stuff. Well, you're right. But now in 2023, we are about to see Scream 6, which promises to be something brand new. The new trailer footage shows Sam, Tara, and their friends now in New York City, being chased and targeted by a brand new ghost face, one who seems to be a bit more serious. In the footage, the survivors end up in what appears to be an old movie theater filled with dozens of memorabilia from the first five ghost faces. We got all the robes worn by the killers, Billy's bloody shirt, and all of Gail's writings, and tons and tons of items that were either on a dead victim or near the events of all the ghost face interactions. This movie is promising to show us some depth. So why do we care? Why do we love this franchise so much? Well, I have a theory as to why all these movies are connected and how this one theme can keep all these films alive and well for years to come. Oh, what is it? You ready? Won't you tell us? Family, family, family. Can't you say right now? Scream is all about family, the love of family, and how that love is so strong it will drive people to either kill or be killed. Just like this franchise and like your family, a lot of fans have a love-hate relationship with it. If you put everything in perspective, you can see the family lines throughout all five movies. Maureen Prescott had an illegitimate son, Roman, who then went on to show some crazy teens, Billy and Stu, that Billy's father was cheating on his mother with his girlfriend, Sydney's mother. This drove Billy and Stu to execute their plan in the first movie. In the second film, it was Billy's mother under the guise of Debbie Salt who convinced Mickey to team up with her to exact her ultimate revenge against Sydney for killing her son, Billy. In the third film, the illegitimate son who started it all, Roman, reveals himself. In the fourth film, Jill donned the mask in order to become as famous as her cousin, Sydney. And in the fifth film, we sub out all the mommy drama for some daddy drama, revealing that our new hero, Sam, is the daughter of Billy Loomis. Ooh, I'm gonna see where you're going with this. Okay, so family can force us to do some crazy things. They can make us happy, sad, mad, and even enraged. But at the end of the day, they're still your family, something you either like living with or not. Don't f with the original. We also have to remember that Scream itself is based on the entire genre that is horror. If you have a theme that works well enough and a cast of legends that have the talent to continue making the story as fun as the first installment, then you've got yourself a hit. And as long as the films can ring up the scares at times to the original source material, the phone calls can keep going and going and going. It happens again and again and again. Or what's your theory for the new one? Well, personally, I think this movie is going to be about the chosen family with Stu Mocker coming back to reprise his role as Ghostface. But he died. Did he? How does that fit into the theme of family? Stu is not related to anyone in the films. Right, but again, I'm thinking this movie might be about chosen family. If you ask any Scream fan, they'll tell you that in the first film, Billy and Stu sometimes seemed a little closer than just friends. That's right, Cindy. I'm gay. So is Ray. What? I ain't gay. What are you talking about? You took it to that club. 
So they play good music. One theory is that Stu survived the TV fall and is still out there somewhere. And maybe he's still a little too obsessed with his former best friend or maybe his once boyfriend, Billy. Now that Billy's daughter, Sam, is of age, it would make sense that Stu would want to reach out with his psycho stepdaddy arms and impress Billy's daughter by making a shine to Billy's work and all they accomplished together, all in the hopes of convincing Sam to join him in another round of prank phone calls. Another theory is that Stu has amassed a large cult of stab enthusiasts. Much like how Paul Dano's Riddler grew an online following in the Batman, Stu could have gathered crazy stab fans ready and willing to do anything for him, even to go as far as bringing all the survivors of the ghost face killings in one place to clean the slate for good. Man, that's deep, but it wouldn't clean the slate completely because Sydney is still alive. Exactly. So, for the seventh installment, wouldn't it just be perfect for Mama Sydney to return to the franchise for one last ultimate duel with Ghostface? Story wise, Sydney is now a mom. She's married to Patrick Dempsey's character from the third film, and we already know that she won't be appearing in this sixth installment, or so we think. So you're telling me there's a chance. To see Sydney go into mom mode after her kids or her husband is attacked would be perfection, finally twisting the plot to where Sydney is now the one hunting Ghostface. Uh, whatever, they just better pay the woman what she's worth. Absolutely, high five. <laughs> But what do you guys think? What are your theories on why this franchise is such a hit? What do you think is going to happen in the next movie? Let me know down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. <laughs>